did some just in time cut and paste, and you will see almost everything I've done <laughs> regarding housing, of course. And I uh, intention.
You have data, you have processing data, and form is the last thing. But when we see things around cities, there's some kind of family air, the way the bars are new, the houses are done. So this model, to me, does not completely describe the way we work. We are like copycats. In a way, we have mirror neurons. So uh, you can't completely erase the memory of form each time. We pretend we are original. We pretend we totally without prejudices. But in the end, when you see things, it's not the way. If you go to the ETH in Zurich and you enter a class, you can see you know, the professor who's teaching the class, if you do to see professors, there's a family air of the project with the students. This cannot be just because of this method. Okay, so I try to concentrate. Now, what I'm trying to say is that I pur purposely show you the bad projects I do also, the compromise projects, the commercial projects, all the you know, empty of the drawers. In, in a way, a quest for honesty. And sometimes you can also learn from failed projects, for compromised projects. You know, we, we don't want to... There's a song by Leonard Cohen, he says, you who are the hero for the sake of the children's stories. Professors like to play the heroes with students, but maybe we're not that heroic. <laughs> okay, so I, I say, I, I try to take, tell things the way they are. Okay, so i start from a very... Simple, um, I say, observation. Why everybody, you know, this city was built exactly like we built our cities, but we have a feeling of second nature. You know, in a way, when we look at the historical city, uh, we have two needs. One is the need of protection, and one is the need of being social. And in a way, historical city, in the streets, in the squares, in the roofs, they give us both of these things, and we feel it as a second nature. The natural feeling of something we built. And this, this is in a way, it's a very powerful image, but it's also a bit kitsch. It can be from you know, some kind of uh, you know, travel agency, uh, but how come sort of everybody likes the historical city? We feel protected by it, we feel it as a natural environment, and this is a picture by Olivo Bambieri. You know, many people in the last 20 years have been trying to talk about uh, ad cities, sprawl, you know, to describe the territory we live in today, which cannot be described anymore in the traditional position between city and country, town and country. I think people said it's so real. I think this territory we live in today, it's very easy to use. Even a child can see a highway sign. We enter highway, we get out of the highway, we go play tennis, we go in a, in a multi-purpose cinema, entertainment center, we shut ourselves in a house. Everything works really well. So this city works. It responds to our needs. The only thing that we miss a bit, you know, in, in the middle of this picture you have this black area where the, you know, Roms go with the big migrants and that, to me, is what is left by the separation of functions. In a way, functionalists have a bad effect. We specialize, so we go have fun in an entertainment center. One could say, do children need playgrounds in Venice? No, because the whole Venice is a playground, in a way. So, this separation to go to have fun into a theme park, an entertainment center, it works, but then, what we miss is the overlapping, the, the something, the way things overlap. So, in a way, the modernist ideal is separating parts, but it works. And today, we are sort of, you know, many, many um, books of the past and theories were against density. You know, it was seen also as the evil of the late 1800 cities. There was a famous map, you know, Engels made a famous essay to the problem of London, the work in London, probably in some Kostad, some, some big cities were quite terrible. So the suburbanization, the Zidlu movement, even if the Zidlu was interesting because if you go to see Bruno Tau, you know, who finds it, I find it very urban in its own way, 
as I think it's interesting, Brotal, who had a, a, an expressionist origin, is the one who did the most memorable symphony because he did that, that just do that. He understood you need to make a place. And the most memorable place of the Hufeisen is the Hufeisen, I mean, Berlin of Witz, because it's arbitrary, because he bent the space, and he made a space, without just a typological approach. That's an interesting thing to reflect on. But we've been talking in Europe about this issue, and we are realizing another thing. This is a diagram of the consumption of energy in these are very not dense cities, especially the American ones, and this is gallons per person per year. And we realize Paris, London, Munich, you know, we stay somehow here. It, this is one seventh of the consumption, so dense cities consume less energy. And this is a diagram of the uh, consumption of a suburban house, a green suburban house, a compact. A green compact, urban and green urban, which means that the worse uh, urban house consumes much less energy than the best green suburban. This for many reasons, we're going to physics, is a question of ratio, you no know, volume, I mean, I don't want to get into it. The red is transportation and the blue is electrical appliances. And on the average, a person in the city consumes one third of the transportation cost, depends also by civilization, this is simplified a bit, you know, and say one half of the electricity of one. So we are rediscovering density also from the point of view of uh, ecology, or at least energy. This is taken from a book by Leslie Martin, an interesting English uh, architect, who tried to do, so we're not just the, the only one who do mathematics, you know, he tried to put together residential de density, needle space, even sunlight, to make some kind of, you know, how compact should be a city. I, I had a, made a work with um, Brian Cody, he's an Irishman, uh, he works at TU Graz, and he's, uh, like, his department called Four Follows Energy, he's a very, and we were discussing do we have an algorithm of the urban model which consume less energy? I've been discussing, well, it's not very easy. It's, it's easy to say about a building, but to calculate all the, the energy consumption of a city, and we see our cities, you know, I've been discussing a lot about this. But this is another interesting thing, also about my lesson, Martin. He took his students, he took, I don't remember exactly the, I think this was like 200 meters and he says, okay, let's make very abstract theoretical models of how you can put the same density on the same side. So, one could say urban villas, maybe outdoors for towers and high rise towers. These are all the same density. And the conclusion by Leslie Martin was that in the end, the number would not just take you there. These are very different urban models. I remember once I was in Soho, in New York, and Soho, you know, has a typical model. Then you, have, you go, there's a moment you go north of Prince Street or anything, and there's a big garden and you have high-rise towers, which I recognize, from the New, Univer New York University housing. And I remember getting out of one of the small streets, you have exactly that, I, I went around like that, I didn't even cross the garden, because in that moment it, I felt lonely. In a way, I followed, I stayed next to the compact city. It's a beautiful place, actually. It had a very nice view, but it felt like a piece from another kind of city. Today, we're trying to put together density and green in this way. You know, the, the magazines are full of these very seductive images. I think that these images are seductive, but I don't feel they're cities. I think there's a, apart from the green washing issue, it's they don't work. You know, this organic ideal of the urbanism of the last century, we have to talk about it. I mean, this is not the argument of my intention. I'm just saying that I think that European cities, this is plus the voice. Nice, probably Saturday afternoon. 
it unites the, in a way, the beauty, but also the, you know, the perfect square with all these porticos. And also, can we see that the European Sea has had a history of putting together nature and architecture in a non hostile position? And regarding this modest planning, um, this is a, an article from Christopher Alexander, 1964, it was called A City is Not a Tree. He says, if we take the tree as a, as a topological model where single dwellings, maybe I have it here, single dwellings, they become neighborhood units, they become like, uh, satellite towns, they become new towns, this is too hierarchical. He says, the historical city does not work like a tree, but rather like a semi lattice where each node is connected to the other nodes in a more complex way. So he considered, paradoxically, this, this structure as too um, rigid. I remember many, 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 many years ago arriving in Dresden, was still the DDR, and my wife had 40 degrees of fever. And in Dresden, you have the station, an esplanade, maybe like Alexander to pass light to the city center. And you have all these slabs, which are the hotels. I went in one hotel and asked, do you have a place? They say, no. But the hotel on the other side of the esplanade, like 70 meters, 60 meters width, has a place. And my wife said, no, Chino, please, I can take my baggage. Can we go to my car? I went, and it took me 22 kilometers. I went to get there because there was a road that it crossed. What I'm saying is that in this structure, if, if, the, if an accident happens here, all these people are totally known. You need redundancy. The, the grid, as opposed to the tree, it means that if something happens here, you can go around. In that case, the, I hated the traffic plan of modernism because it had no redundancy. You need two kidneys, you can sell one, you need twice, you know. You need you know, God gave us the spare tire in our body. So you need two things. So that's also okay. So that's okay. This is beyond one last thing before I show you my project is this dilemma. This is the house the architects like, even, and this is the house people. <laughs> Which one would you buy if you had if your grandmother, American grandmother gave you, you know, four hundred thousand euros? I don't know. I think these are the two kitsch. I think they're both kitsch. In a sense that this is the idea by the architects that the house can be a pure work of art. You know, is is not accepting the it, there's a very famous passage by Adolf Floss, it's called Architecto, it's 1910. He says, let me take you no, I don't want to go to the first part. He says, basically, uh, the architecture is not art. He's talking about domestic architecture. Because art wants to rip away man from tranquility and man expects from the house a coziness, tranquility to conserve everything is done. You know, a house, a art can please only the, the person who owns it, the, the house that please everyone. So would I say that Architecture is not art. He says the only architecture which is art is the tomb and the monument. All the rest is so. Uh, Adolf Loss says domestic architecture is not art, or architecture is not art. It may be a polemical way, but it's an interesting issue. So, can you make, when you go to Nouvelle Cuisine restaurants, you know, let's say tonight we have to go to a restaurant. Um, you know, sometimes the Belgian restaurant, they think you can feel totally sub sublime sensations. Of course we like food, of course we like good food, but how high can the food go so they give you just one cover piece with the smell of vinegar taken from the Mazar Islands, I guess, you know? Or would you go to eat like that? So in this poll, I think try to get a house to that level, it almost can break. Uh, I did heard that most of the Kazuko Sejima houses, which I really respect, they're totally abandoned because you can come out of the window. I mean, if I would leave my four kids there, they would put Pokemon stickers all over the place. They would not survive 
10 minutes. So the beautiful to see pictures, I'm trying to many Japanese architects or Fujimoto, you like this, but I don't think really would leave, I think Katsuko Sejima is a great artist, greatest artist, I don't know if you could buy a heart. I mean, this is a heart, you don't have a door, it's so small, it's very cold because the, 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 the... So I would say that domestic architecture is something which, I don't know, in a way, I don't think it's very conservative. How, how many experiments you can do? Of course, this is all the other way, you know, the, the pony pocket sort of ideal that, you know, the house will protect. But in a way, you, you see yourself more on a, on a ruling chair. So I, I probably, this is the, I mean, the, I, I think that there's a war somehow. Okay. And this is what the people do to architects when they want to force. This is a famous quarter by Le Combusier in Pessac. It was very experimental. They were so on the house, very beautiful. The space of beauty. But this is what happened after years. You know, th this guy didn't feel well in the abstractness of his architecture, so he put this, and then he put windows. If windows are eyes, these are the tears of the Okay, so let's start from the theme of a single family house. Maybe I'm already very long, but this is one of my first projects. Actually, one student of mine had an aunt called Nadia de Grasso, the United States Country Town. He came back from the Erasmus, said, Chino, my, he wasn't even graduated. His uncle said, you would like to design the house. And then he didn't have the license to be architect. I said, let's do it together. So he brought me as a client. So, um, this, uh, let's say, finally he made the first project and I gave a little bit of, I don't want to say retro flavor to the house. I said, you cannot do a house without a roof. Let's take the roof and let's make an outer space. Usually the suburban house is always in the center of the plot with five meter distance, living distance. I said, let's try to make, to, to get a, new, a meaningful open space. Go really quick. So the idea you could play ping pong under here. So it's a very plain house, all great. But the idea is not so much about the house, it's about can you in a suburban situation create an outer space? This is a sag, I don't go very quick, I don't explain all the drawing. This is a strange thing because I went to give a lecture in Croatia and Peter Green, he was the oldest guy in Aki retired from architect in CA Holland, said Shinanzuki. I like to lecture, maybe we do something together. Five or six years later, they call me up and say, do you want to do a house in Holland? I say, sure. And say, we, we did a master plan. We did one um, boulevard connecting to museums, and it's a suburban quarter. And we want the houses on the main boulevard to be a little bit by good architects. So the guy who buys the plot, either he comes with a good architect we approve, because in Holland, the architects in the master plan and they have quite power, or we suggest, and we suggest your name to a dentist and say, okay, so this dentist comes down to Milano with his wife, uh, say, buongiorno, you know, like this, you know, and we, we suggest your name, I put all my money in this house, I say, okay, we want, or we have two kids, you know, we've been uh, there, we in ancient days, it's a little bit next to Germany. He, actually, he was working in Germany, he was a Dutch guy on, on, on the borderline. Then he said, uh, you know, okay. then after uh, <coughs> half an hour, he may have told us an hour or more you know, like this, I like to cook, listen, and I said, but tell me what you really like. He said, no, no, we were never there, your famous architect. He said, no, please tell me, no, no, we were never there. Then he said, please, and the lady takes out a house and garden and said, I would like a terrace like this. I said, maybe, I said, maybe we will not give you exactly that, but I did. 20 days later, I, I go to Amsterdam, we sit with uh, me, the client, and um, Fritz van Dongen, he's a good uh, architect who was a second architect. I show you, I show you the house. Then, actually, this is Fritz van Dongen. This is my client, his wife. And this is the diastomon I'm talking about. 
And here he said, Chinazuki, let's drink a glass of wine, because it was a little houseboat going around Amsterdam. He said, you don't know how nervous I was this morning driving up my car, two hours car, by Eschede, because I was thinking about driving. OK, now Chinazuki is going to show me the house. And what happens if I don't like it? Because I put all my money of my life in there. And now I saw it, I think it's fantastic, so let's drink. And I got really moved. I said, OK, maybe this house is also going to be published because they're all architects' houses. But you know, to me, the house is yours. So this is the result. The master plan wanted, let's say, stately house, something which would reinforce the boulevard. So basically, you have an outer space, a very, very good kitchen, a study room. And this is the entrance. You know, in Holland, they have also in the bathroom the entrance, in the TV room. And then in the end, I need a TV which would go the other places. So this is sort of the cozy TV. This is a bit more formal dining room, very open to the park, the stair. And this is a shortcut and a chimney, the, the dining, and sort of the laundry and the, the parking. Very simple, with a breakfast room. The, the architect in CA wanted a quite stately, a set relationship. Actually, it was a quite complex master planning. You could choose to make some volume. It was not that free. So, and the back of it, it was originally supposed to be all glass. This was like a little model. So you had the need to be a little bit, the idea that there were suburban houses, but we reinforced the street. And so the, 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 the design here was done commonly. So the idea is that the face of the street is quite formal. This is actually a Wilson house. This is a memorable. In a way, they construct. They were single pieces. The only one strange one was uh, uh, Van Engela here. He did like a stone edge. Oh, okay. Well, built in brick. And then I didn't have that much money, so in the end, the back is zinc. I don't have. And then I never took good pictures. So this is the only picture I have while we were building. So this is zinc. And actually, I didn't follow so much also the interior. For example, I did not expect at all that they would paint the, I, you know, I, they, I mean, there's some nice spaces. This is the stair going up, and this is a shortcut stair. This space is actually quite nice. I never really went to see the figure. Thing. Then I called them up and said, can you send me a picture? I never see the green. And they sent me this, we did it in Aneto da Giambino, you know, they have. So they're happy, they're very happy. But that's, that's, that's the way people live. I mean, I, you know, I'm happy you know, they put all these Christmas things. Why should we be so uptight about things? I mean, I'm really happy at least embracing it. Okay. Now I'll show you the picturesque project. In this case, picturesqueness was prescribed. It was a project in Faenza. And in Faenza, you have very deep, um, the historical scene is very deep plots. So the, I don't have the master plan, but they tried to reproduce that, but I thought this was not possible because the plots were very, very deep, but in the old times, just one family would live in one house. Now, eight people would live. So basically, this is a strange project because you enter, you have one, two, three, four, and one comes there, and it was incredibly compact. So. Um, this is the upper floor, so we go up here, and the, this, this uh, uh, duplexes, duplexes, they're mesomets, and these are, you know, like this. But then we try to handle, you know, can you reproduce the, the compactness of an historical fabric? No, because these people, they belong to different families. So what would be, I mean, it's a sociological thing. So we try to do this sort of screen things and to give some light to, not really do is that to acquaint for this process, even if in Italy everybody puts up those and this and that. Okay. This is another strange project. It was a very big, La Veno is on the Lago Maggiore, on the Lombardy side of it. There was a very, very big ceramic factory. They did a master plan here. This is the, the town, so it was in an incredible position on the lake. It's very difficult to find sites like this in the lake. This is this is situation, okay? So it, it was here. So you know, that job is very nice. And there was a previous master plan, and they didn't like so much, and they called architects to redo a bit the master plan. 
So this is, was our proposal for the master plan. There was a hotel uh, taking a, a part of the old factory, and a very the innovation was there was a very big garden over here. We did not win the competition of the master plan. One works well, but then. They, this was our original submission. They gave us to, to do these houses. So the master plan was not ours, but they liked the architecture, so on the front lay they gave us. Then they failed. Actually, there were uh, investors from Bolzano, you know, but the money was really low. So this was our original proposal, including this was a hotel with some the part from the existing factory, and we sort of got to do this part. And uh, they stopped, and then they start, and then they have to try to play that the story is very, very terrible. But then in the end, they sort of built it. So this is this is a project from 15 years ago. They just finished it, so it was so it, it's strange because on the lake side uh, we tried to really it was also the south side to move really as large as also as partially touristic. I think many Germans have caught it here. The lake is, you know, the Italian lakes are traditionally. So this is just not totally finished, but it's just opening up so these two shops here. It, because in a way it's a square at the end of the city. And we, I admit, we try to do some picturesqueness. You see, there must be a detail here. We did an old stranger color combination. Because, you know, we try to be modern, but somehow the Town was a typical Italian, more villages, you know. And we did, actually, they didn't do it as nice as we wanted to, but we did a pattern of wooden things with a different color. Actually, this was originally in the back, it's not very well realized, it was all the line that is it a permutation of color, so you had to go into it. And the apartments are quite nice, they have a very nice view. And the back side is like a village. We were the first one to build. So here we will be terracing up very bad ramp on the one we designed it. But so it's a very double phase project with a sort of almost village on the back and the sort of largest And in some distributive solution in, in Italian we have this called the Casa Ballatorio. Ballatorio is like a external railing. So we, this is you know, you have the external stairs and going up in the place. Okay. So, uh, this is a competition won by Stephen Hall in Helsinki. Actually, it was some military barracks. I go quickly to this because... Okay. So, it was a very difficult uh, place to be. But then, the, in this case, this is west, east-west. The, the, the Helsinki people really like the sun of the sunset, because you know, in the winter the sun is really low, it's quite north. So, and they like private saunas also. So all the apartments, now in this case we have a common sauna here. So basically the east where you have the bedrooms is this side. Quite plain. And then the the, the west is all full of green houses and you have so in this case is a building which is really looking into the sun and, and have all this sort of veranda and even have the balcony going into the ground. Then I want to talk about Milano for a moment, you know, I think. Milano was quite heavily bombed during the second war. In 1943 we got bombed. And these are the black ones were all and there was a, a debate about the reconstruction, and not to say the best, while Dresden and Rotterdam has been uh, rebuilt on a modernist plan, in Arno there was a decision of uh, keeping the, let's say, as, not totally, but uh, adapting to the existing grid and trying to build in the halls with new buildings. This is a master plan from 1950s by Piero Bottoni. He was a little bit the most influential urbanist. And the grey buildings are the existing ones, and the white are the new ones. So you see, the, the, the peculiarity of Milano is that they kept, as much as they can, the existing city layout. 
and they try to insert, say, modernist building into the city layer. One of the models is done by Bottoni was to make a low base which would fit in the context and they say high rise um, which would uh, look for light and air. So it was a sort of double strategy instead of doing just steps like that. Um, and actually, actually, I, I was born here and I live here now and I wrote a book about this, this, this year. So all this is 30 meters radius is my life. Okay. And now this tree today is this high. So this is a picture from when I was born. But this model of having lower body, um, this is actually my balcony. In the palace of like Fontana, I did not here. And I looked to the Zagabat building, and this is a building from the 1500. And you see you have three high-rise buildings. This is not very nice, but this is quite interesting building. And so on. And in a way, you can say that even if it's a very modernist building in language, um, it, it's, it's, it, it's uh, something that at the time was considered a compromise, and I think now Milano uh, said, you know, and many people come to Milano to see this strange of modernist, sort of kind of gentle modernist who try to fit in. This is the most strange building in Milano. The architects love it, I mean, it's a love and hate. Still, it's very expressionist by Luigi Moretti. You have a low base following, and then it's sort of slab, and it's all reacted this way. So these are just the kitchens. So it's an it's a, it's a artistic version of the model, you say. And this is not a building actually by Snagavender. They say they did that. It's later, this is from the late 60s. Also, you know, there's a setback, but always a piece who try to graft in. So there's always an attention to the building facade. Even if you set back because of light and air, you do that. And actually, many years ago, I wrote a book, but then this as Nagavelli were totally unknown. And then they do, everybody is Nagavelli, all, all the people from Switzerland come. And then um, uh, Adam Caruso from Mon Caruso San John, they just wrote a book. Actually, this is the building. So, so, this sort of modernism, it's quite interesting. And this is just photographs taken from my Vespa as I go to the University of Common Facades of Milano after the Second World War. And that's what I was saying, this sort of you know, banal architecture that still somehow gives a rhythm to the background of the city. It's not just really sort of and I had the occasion to talk about facades as inhabited screens. You know, in a way, facade is a buffer between the looking from the interior out, but also we don't have to forget that the facade is also the backdrop of the public space. It's a mediator in a way, it's a buffer. Actually, my grandmother is there. <laughs> Though it's very family. My, I think, one of my first girlfriends lives here. <laughs> okay, so what to do? This is a building I recently completed, 2007. Actually, I won a competition, but I don't have the competition submission. This is a quite high level, uh, it's not the cheapest things in buildings I did. It's right next to the new big thing of Milano, Bosco Verticale is somewhere here, the new park. And this is the Caesar Palace Tallest in Milano, the station. And we had to do a block, which was not really a block, because it was very narrow, it was difficult to build the two sides because, you know, the portion we had to do. But still, it's so... So I got to do this, and for another, for another um, client, I did this also. So, it's, it's quite a complicated story. The ground floor, so what we try to do is to reproduce some kind of, I would say, traditional way of relating to the street. So in a way, Milano, we have the entrance, the gallery, and you see sometimes the back garden, and also some kind of common space. And there's, there's a lot of variety of um, cuts, some small ones. This is just one bedroom, two bedrooms, and this. The very, very big stepping up uh, terraces as you want. 
this was an original sketch, and one of my friends said, Chino, are you a vintage architect? I said, no, no, I said, no, I'm not vintage, but in that project I see maybe, maybe the definition is not that bad. I think I consciously tried to do a project which was very double-faced. This is the elevation over the street, and this is the big balcony is over the garden, so it's a very polarized project. And actually, Cesar Pelli got, this was a, I go back for a moment. Actually, he got it wrong because, I mean, uh, there was an axis here, and this entrance was not any axis. So I, I, in a way, I did a good thing to Cesar Pelli. I bent <laughs> to, because you know this was he didn't trace it well, so it was on the, not on the axis of the street. So I also did some gentleness, the bend. Okay. So this is the Pelli. The other way. The pictures are not very good, they're a bit mixed up. I have to put them together this afternoon. And I was conscious in doing this. In, in a way, I cannot call it a bow window, because a bow window is something you really look out. In this case, it's more like a, a little tower. Like, because these are the stairs, and these are the bathrooms. So this is the bathroom. But this is all bathrooms and bathrooms and stairs. This sort of articulation of the sun, because the building is still quite tall. And then, I always wonder, a very big problem in modern architecture is the roof. You know, in a way, formally, it rains on planet Earth. I know very, very, very few modern buildings who could solve well the roof without taking it away. Why? Modernists took away the roof, it's an umbrella. If you ask, nobody ever can tell you why. I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm natural. I ask which is Nazi. No, Gaffetti. Okay, look at Gaffetti. He's a Swiss guy. Said all the five points of the Corbusier, the Tetto Giardino, the Toa Giardino. Now, said you no. Know, in your houses, you don't really have a Toa Giardino. He could not tell. In a way, it's a formal option. You know, we saw the 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 Teovandes book house. But if someone, if a layman say, why do architect, modern architect took away the roof, nobody can ask. They go around the question, but they can't ask. Like a hat, you know, like it's rain. It's like going in the rain with no hat only because we feel cool. No, we don't. So, in a way, I, I know very, in the sun houses, I'm not talking about just the roof, but the roof with the overhang. That's interesting, because other possibilities. So, for example, one of the most beautiful I know is the uh, Gardella house in the Borsalino house. Okay, so this is, sorry about the pictures. So this is the, the say, the garden side with the common. Uh, so you enter in a very traditional way on this side. You have this double height entrances, and this side you have a common concierge, and then you get directly to the garden. And then I, the some client next door said, Chino do you want to build also this? So I, my client said, hey, listen, the neighbors asked me if you want to build. And and say, can I do it? Because, you know, I don't want you to. They said, yes, but if you keep the two things separated, we try to negotiate. We're not really friends. So he was happy to do it. So I had two clients, sometimes fighting on the same plot. But we tried to do something embracing the two things. This is the garden side. The lodges actually are very nice and deep, and here now this is very green. This is pictures. And I never take very good pictures. This is from the neighborhood, which has also some landscaping. But you see this very big transparency here. It's, it's a very strange place because you have the high skyscraper in Milano, but also you have uh, it's, it's a very patchworky space. You see the terraces are very nice, and how to hide the chimneys. The atriums, you, you look out into this house from the turn of the century. And that is the reflection on, on Caesar Palace. So uh, we, we did a texture building also 
I mean, it was not totally planned, but it's funny. It's like oh, it's like an over, over text. Get the lot aside. And these are put together, say the street side, the north side of this. And if you see this, sometimes we go to the historical city, we take pictures, and some, some, some photographers or painters, they use the word painterly. If you go to Venice, you see all these you know, painters in the street. So you can say Venice is a painterly subject. What does it mean? Uh, can, what, when is too much? In a way, the larger, you know, if I imagine in a functional way, indeed you can dine there, this is copper, I can explain you everything in a functional terms, but I admit that from this point of view, these are textures, like, like in a dress. You know. what, where is the point where you get, you know, the word formalistic, in a way, Modernists said the facade is a formal problem, it does not exist. You know, we look at the plan, if you do a good plan, the facade will come out by itself. It's a sort of moralistic, communistic attitude. Of course, Catholics, they like to dress up. Anyway. So you can say, is a facade Catholic? No, I'm joking. Is the Catholic, Catholic side of the building? You need. No. Anyway, it's, it's just reflections. Okay. Just to say that this, on the other side, you have to mediate. This person will put up something, his own, and this and that. And in a way, that's why I say it's a buffer. It's an environmental buffer between the rights of the inside, but also the rights of the outside. Okay, so that's the other building. The problem with the other building and the master plan had a 12 meter high slab, like this. So that, that if you go, go back for a moment. This was the original master plan. Uh, here. So, this building, the problem that this is north-south, so this building which was 12 floor high, would get completely one facade north, and this is south, but then the nice view was on the north, but then, you know, the depth of the thing means the apartment only looked north. So, I managed, and I really fought for it, to cut it in two and get this deeper, so to get, to get a way of this here, and to make it there. So I'm very proud of having negotiation, negotiating with the city a change of the master plan. So I cut it in two, I made a common I drew. So everybody gets to see you have one, two, three floors apartments. So everybody gets a bit of east, west. You never have straight north, you always have size. That's the old building, that's the other one. And that's the scale of the surrounding sort of late 18th century things. This is brick, maybe the color brick. This is still construction. Images, rendering, I hate renderings. In this case, the balconies are all round because of sun orientation. So the, the whole the balconies is a centralized typology, so the typology is quite different. And I always do very deep balconies that you can really live in. And you have a brick. In the original project, the brick was a little bit darker color, clay. So here you don't see very much you have stripes, but then the client wanted say no, it's, it's too dark. So we negotiated a lot. So sometimes you see the stripes, sometimes sometimes you don't see. It, they just almost look like a text. So we had some of these vertical stripes. I don't have good pictures of the H room, but it's actually it's quite nice. It connects the two. It's very transparent on both sides. And also you have always to equate that in an urban building you can also have a view of the building from far away. Okay. This I go quick, they just uh, lost competitions. This was a super dense project where 
you need this all the respect of the 16 degrees, you know, like building code you can get. So you, we had to do all these volumes here in a very tight uh, situation because it was substituting to them. So it, it's an attempt of doing urban, let's say, high-rise towers connecting. I go quickly. Yeah. That's a sketch with having some kind of element touching the ground and also the, the sides are exactly the same height as the nearby building because it was a curtain wall. It was actually two slabs incredibly dark in the middle but was, the original building was like that. And then, so these go with the things. And as you set back, you go high but then you create some kind of open court with the things. In this sense, it's not exactly, you know, I show you these models of the reconstruction of Milano, but this principle is not just a tower. It's a tower cascading down and fitting in. I think genetically I got a little bit with my blood, maybe even that house. Maybe you absorb urban landscapes through your when you play. Okay. So this you know, is like trying to something like a portico cascading up at the scale of the nearby buildings and this is okay. This is a competition where Francesco Balcopi, the director of Casabella, I don't think he's an architect, he's a good historian and critic, and he made the, the master plan itself. It was the competition, this is Zaha, the uh, Dibeskin and the uh, Dibeskin and uh, Ilate Zaki, the one, the people who won the this is Zadi actually. And then they totally fucked up, sorry about the word, the market, and they made the buildings were too luxurious. So this project really stopped because it was for a market, or we're not all soccer players in Italy, you know, like how people can afford it. So they made a competition here to go a little bit down market, but the, the, plan, the master plan had two towers here and a big block here. So it was in a way really given. And it was strange because they said, there were residential towers next to these towers. These two have been built and this not yet. So it's an essay again on very bulky buildings. I don't go into it. What? Again, it's much easier to me to design uh, an office building because it's like a pen. The, the, in a way, the design of an office building high rise is like this. You, you get a a shape and you get a good technology of the facades and that's it. In houses, you have the size of man is always there with a parapet, with a loggia corresponding to the outside. So I think that the high-rise tower is much more difficult to design than the office towers. The worst project by Calatrava is the Malmo residential tower. It's horrible. No? Calatrava has made fantastic buildings, but that really just don't look at the house, it's like something like that. So I think you know, the problem of scale is a very difficult one. Because you always have the, the scale of the parapet. So this idea of having the scale of man People like to put flowers, so I, I, don't, I don't understand why, you know, life is hard. Why would you make it harder? The young people in my studio, they think it's coolest, not even, you know. Whenever I say, why don't we design flower pots, they look at me like I'm their grandmother. I mean, why? <laughs> and yet they have to be tough to be good architect, I don't understand. And I feel, they say it's an essay on the idea of scale. Can you do something which totally respect this inside out outside in the end? Okay. Um, I go quickly. Uh, this is a magazine saying so uh, Chino Zuki, everybody talks about co housing, you know, this and that. And um, would you make us a sketch? I say, you know, I don't like the yeah, yeah, but no. So I made a sketch as I can normal people with very traditional apartment live next to maybe a commune and 
you know, with, for example, with you know, big common kitchen, this and your co-housing. The other day I was trying to say, can I, I, I'm doing co-housing, I said, can I see a real co-houser in front of me? Because everyone talks about co-housing, but very few people did. I have a porno on that, on that, on that, on that one. You want a porno side of you? Does everybody want a porno side of you? I want, no, I don't want it. You want a porno side? No, I want it. Okay, 1980, I went to Berlin, and I was in a commune, I was hosted by a commune, I was just graduated, and they all lived together in a big house, in a big things with a mattress, and everybody was sleeping. And I was a guest in Litterstrasse, I remember, in Berlin. It was the Grüne, the Grüne side of Viva, very radical people. You know. And then I was there. Then I was a student, I got to Fiasse <coughs> with a German girl. And I said, Selina, why don't you come to sleep with me in my room? Because her role boyfriend lived in the big masters. There was a meeting. Chino and Zucchia and Selina are separatists. You know, if you want to live in Komune, say, I don't want to come to live, to, to sleep in the room with all these naked big German males. You know, you don't, don't even have the bathroom on the, on the door, the bathroom to see all these things. I mean, and I, I'm joking a bit. There's a film it's called Together about joking about the commune. So we keep on talking about co-housing. I'm doing co-housing, but then what does it really mean? It's a, we have all this. Um, urban, you know, um, all this sort about uh, urban agriculture. If you talk to the real agriculture people, they say this Photoshop. I mean, let's, let's be serious about this. Resiliency, smart city. Now, resiliency, repeat the word I always use, resiliency. You have just talk, 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 talk. Even the most uh, the most important issue, which is sustainability for the planet, is just the world. I mean, can we talk about things and then describe things as they are? Because in the modern world, you see is a Photoshop world. Everybody talks about things they never even know what a, what a zucchini is. Okay. <laughs> you know? I mean, okay. Just to say, okay, okay, not for it, but, uh, this was the co-housing, you know, like this. But uh, we'll talk about it. Okay, so I just wanted to say that uh, can we have a certain gap okay, of resiliency between the single, this is actually just took some pieces of paper to get a say. Does the, the reasoning on the single cell has to do also with the city shape? You know, can you do a tower to also support? Okay, so this, that the day after the Coney up and said, you want to do, you know, there's an expo here and there was a plan. Uh, uh, master plan died by Citerio and really, really dense one. And they commissioned two towers, actually, these are the two towers. Okay. So they also commissioned us the, the open space, and we managed again to, these are the towers we did, to take away one tower. I think it's way too dense. So it was a collective work of building, it was the houses for the temporary people. Who go into Expo, then they will sell it for so this is really cheap housing. This is really social housing. Okay. And then we got also to do the it was a little bit in the middle of nothing, so this was the entrance. Actually, for reasons we did not yet build this, it's the uh, so we just designed very quickly the open spaces. This is Cucinella, some young architects, and the entrance. Good. And and it was so dense, I said, at least let's leave, we call it a blue canyon. <laughs> so I'm kind of stepping up. So this was our building. You see how, actually, in the, uh, the cells are really tight, but here they wanted just single rooms, almost no common space, because it was for the all employees. So we planned something that would be, have an initial room here, and then after the expo, on the living room. So there was a very interesting research also on the furniture. But you see how many how many cells that distributed by one stairwell. So this is the most say economical building I did. But then it had to be decent. See, this is the, the extra room you could take out. And again an exercise for example we didn't have 
so little money to do uh, many times I do high windows, but here I have no money. So the build the the, the the windows are just very tight and very squares in the balconies, of course. But the idea is how to keep something almost by graphics. I, I chose to a dark color and a white color, but just not to make Plattenbau kind of. So it's a formal, you know, strategy in a way for the gigantic. Or it's all prefabricated. Okay. This is just, I don't know, this is a boring work of Shinozuki, it's just a block into very peripheral aluminum. So this is my B side, you know, I have Armanian and Pavio Armani kind of side. I just want to show it also because it's a, not commercial, I wouldn't call it commercial, but just the plain everyday black bread, I would say, architecture we do. So this is an existing fabric always with a little bit of a corner shop. You know, we don't work so much on the program because it's the client working on the program. It's very difficult to manipulate. But also always try to get some kind of, there's a garden here, so you get high rise, but also going down and also caring about, in this case, the corners. So always a very, an attitude not to consider just the type, but to deform the type to create an open space. I think it's a bit of a Baroque attitude. If you go to Rome, I'm joking, and this is an ethnic joke. I'm saying that um, if you think of, a, of just a typological city, it's a bit of a block city, a little bit like Lego city. I think the lesson of Baroque is creating a Fontana di Trevi, a Piazza di Spagna, Piazza La Mona. It's something which embraces you. It's an inside out, the argument of Colin Rowe, College City. You know, that the whole city is like the space is ditched in and it is there. This is a project on the last in Novena. Actually, there was a, a project in the 80s here. And then they called Stefano Boeri. He made an idea, can you call it master plan, to make this public, which is not yet, and to make this just a big garden. Actually, now the city is here and on the road went like that. Then he lasted three, four months. He's a, he's a friend of mine, Stefan. But he just gave a put out, you know, they just wanted something to make it shine. So we had to build a building, which is, I think, is this. This was a fabric of very small factories and things like that, you see it, with all different properties. So this was a plot, this was another plot. I think that his master plan was conceptually brilliant, but totally wrong, because it implied a, a how can I say, um, a power to do it that nobody ever had. So it's, it's a design that I understood from the first moment. It was all fetal generation, all a little bit of ecological, like this, but nobody could have the property to do that. So I had to design a building into this master plan, but I understood it was not a master plan. This is my building. Again, okay, this is the cheapest building I ever did, it's just plaster, and it overlooked the canal, but now the space on the canal, this is private here, and if you go here, they shoot you. I mean, this is the, the state, it's like a totally interesting. So, we did something which was open to the canal, to thinking that in 30 years, Stefano ideal to make this a beautiful promenade here could happen, now this is not it, you only get from the back. So, I was cautious to do it. So, this is still just an infrastructure and there's a gate here and you cannot cross or you get shoot it. I mean, shoot it in a sense that it's, like, it's a casco, so it's a place. So, it was like, you know, a single residential building in this panorama, which is still this way, because they've never transformed it. I mean, or maybe they, I hope they transform it. In Ravetti, you have the mosaics. So, you know, in a way, we said, okay, let's do the waterfront, you can cross here. But then, you know, the, the access was from the back. So, this, you arrive from this side. It's nice, we need this sort of uh, <laughs> Just with plaster, or with plaster, it's very cheap. Okay, I try to go a bit quicker. This is actually another interesting case. I mean, every project would need time to talk. We did a, a workshop together with Yo Cohen because one investor was ING 
from Holland and the other were local people. It was a dismissed industrial area in uh, Parma, which is a quiet town. And actually, I don't show you my master plan. In the end, they chose a master plan by, I don't have the original here by, by your coin, but what is interesting is that when your coins show he was famous to do the ceramic, the Maastricht uh, ceramic, the Italian people went and understood that the, the way the Dutch live on the ground floor, you can go and pay, even the house I did in Holland, you can go there and pick a, an apple and eat it. Italians would never, ever, ever accept to be the ground floor without fencing off. So basically, the, there was a giraffe and a, and a pig, and they chose the pig and they said, Can you make it a little bit taller the neck? Can you make some spots here? But it's a pig, we will not touch your pig. So they tried to throw the pig into a giraffe without saying. So they said, you know, mm, we don't like very much people walking underneath the building. This white is a setback and is a railing, say there's a five meters thing. So he made like a bonus portable kind of Dutch, or I could also is done a bit this way. And the Italians, uh, by putting request, they totally change it and they make it a very boring suburban thing. Just with so they ruin this master plan in a way. But you understood that, that in their mind that you just want Palazzina, we call them. That once they're one elevator block, four sides, like urban villas kind of thing with big batteries. It was exactly the reverse of the fabric like things. This is about customs again and expectations and ways of doing. Almost prejudices, as we would say. And I remember going out at dinner with the Dutch investor, who was very intelligent. He said, Chinonzuki, you know, I didn't expect you to be so conservative about this uh, ground floor privacy. And he said, I very admire of your knowledge of Dutch architecture, because I mentioned architects from the 30s, nobody knew. I'm very impressed by your knowledge, historical knowledge, but I said, we Dutch people, we, knew, we, we know how to do very good urban design. And like the BMW comes in Italy, you have the Fiat and sells good cars. We Dutch, we come to you and if we need, we will teach you new lifestyles. Very interesting. He was not talking about like a real estate guy, he was talking like a messianic. I really like that, but you know, it's a question, it's an interesting issue. Okay, so then we got to do inside the master plan of your coin, the four by the white rings. This, 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 here. The ground floor is the issue is that you go through, you go up, but you need private gardens here. And so every, the problem what to do on the ground floor of this kind of so semi-suburban things. The upper floors, uh, the other day I said in my studio, I got so bored. We keep on doing one stair block with one, uh, say, one bedroom apartment facing south of the location and two bedroom apartments, one two bedroom and one bathroom. Because in Italy, at least one bathroom needs a natural ventilation, so that's also changes in kitchen and things. And we always do the same thing. I'm so bored by it, but it works so well because it's very flexible, because this can buy that. So this interlocking solution. I'm so, it's like doing always the same recipe, but then in the end I always end up because it's the one who works best in, in, in this situation. The facades, again, in, you know, the, the, they wanted these patios so that the privacy on the street, on the ground floors, was done by raising a bit and also by doing these sort of patios. And this is the inside, now it's very green again, so this is, uh, you know, the, the, the private cells on. Inside. So and this is the outside. So we have this sort of patios which feed the privacy of the ground floor. And that's it. Okay, not, not very interesting. Okay. Oof. Okay. I hope Chinatsuku will finish soon. Uh, uh, the market of Bologna next to the station, it was here. This is the new station by Yozaki, the uh, building by Cucinella, the new building, and it was all big precincts. So this theme of reurbanizing industrial precincts is something very important in Italy, I think, in Europe. 
There was a big master plan. Uh, this was the master plan, and some private people bought one, two, three blocks, and they made a private competition and we won. The master plan was interesting. It had low bodies and high rest hours, but it was too tight. This was 10 meters, which is totally uneconomical, and this tower, which is slim, very nice, you can do because if you do a stair block, you have no more substance. So in a way, it was a nice master plan, but economical, and we tried to open it up to the south. For so this was the master plan, and our response was to take away the block to the north or the south to do that. Then all this operation were really too big economical crisis. A uh, lot of uh, say construction companies, totally, including mine, totally failed. This was so. In the end, we just did that. We, we want one, two, three pieces, but the built one is only this. So this is free market house and this is social house. This was the competition. You see the size of the towers, this, which is nicer, and this, which is the only thing you can build because of size. Another interesting issue I was saying the other day. If you have a building with two faces, I'm going to technicalities of it. You look at, in Italy, since you have one natural ventilated bathroom, this depth cannot be much more than 12 meters because if you because you have to put the bathroom in natural ventilation. In northern countries you can go 14, 15 meters because you can put all the services inside. But we need to do that. But then in a tower, let's say if you calculate the ideal um, size of the tower is like 20 by 20, just give you an idea. The problem is that it, why? Because it looks all around. So, a linear building with only two lights and a central building with four lights is different. It's optimized in a different way. When you have a tower with a low base, the problem is that if you take down the tower, which is big, uh, which the apartments look all on the four sides, when you go down, one apartment is blind. So, the transition, either you do a single tower, 20 by 20, and a single flat 12 depth, or it's not so easy for economical reasons, also for life reasons. Just to say that we, in a way, these are linear bodies which get bigger in the tower. So we got it fat because here, but it cannot get bigger here. It's, it's an interesting, of course, thing. So the towers get more. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reasoning in terms of proportion. Okay. So this is subsidized housing social housing and that's, they have very different costs. But we always try to do things with style. So this is made of, this is a rendering, this is building, this is plaster, this is brick, and aluminum. construction. And we have this motif, which on the outside facade, it's like lodges. And then when you get inside, it's like you take out of the arm. So it's also, it's also related to sun orientation. It's a question of also east, west. So. This is how I always... I go to the next projects and then you take the pictures on my project. More green. So this semi-enclosed court, it gives you coziness but also dialogue with we didn't want to close the block, so we have transparency to that. So the, the idea that the two social classes are the dialogue. We have green roofs. That's the, we try to make very cheap buildings with, with some dignity. In this case, we can only use color. Because the details are very simplified, they just... This building go constructed for 900 euros a square meter, so it's very costly. Okay. Okay. Oof, this is a little talk. This is a This is a competition we want, but they did not do it. And the, the only interesting things I want to talk about is was 
it was a program of social housing of different types, and all these different weathers, all people and people to be so. Uh, but we also did a layout that could, uh, in a way, have different typologies. So to me, the, the urban layout should survive the typological choices. This is all the services who actually made the ground floors. I don't want to talk ahead. Okay. Let me make a joke again, second second ethnic joke. I have a German friend living up my studio. She's uh, uh, her husband was on cocaine, she had the old song, so he kicked away the husband and now she fell in love with another. So I went to a seminar in Turin about new kinds of housing. And then they made five groups of students. The students who were dealing with the under 35 people, the, the students who were dealing with the over 65 people, the students who were dealing with a group of the migrants, the, the students who were dealing with uh, uh, single families, like mononuclear families, and the one about the housing. Okay. Now, if I'm 35 and I live in a cell for the under 35, and I tur turn 20, 36, you have to go away, and then if this lady lives in an apartment for the single families, she cannot fall in love anymore. So we are, I did that cohabitation of young people, every, you know, we color code all of this, young people, big families, this and that, the single. And then in a, in a, in a statistics, in France and in Austria, because I also work in Austria, uh, more than 50% of the apartments, existing apartments, is statistically occupied by just one person. Which means, uh, in reality, all these co houses go by one, not two people, one people. So, the, okay. so I'm saying that we do, we did that, but do we really believe that these have to go here and the other in there? Maybe in the old city, there's more flexibility. So I don't believe so much. At that time, this idea that to go to the new ways of living, every time a son is born, you have to build something like a red cube on the roof, I don't believe it so much. I think the historical city survived because of certain rise of typological generosity. It's a debate we would have. I did that, but I don't believe it. I'm not discussing it. Okay. See? Three or cards, three, four, you know, the middle of this mix. Okay. That's the open discussion we have, but I think we also have in this country. This is a Dutch project. I, I don't talk about it. I mean, I, there's, there's an attention span I put to many. I put all, all my life in this PowerPoint. <laughs> it was three, you know, the one I get was three typologies, the small houses with the, with the car underneath, the middle size, like a cascading thing. But this was very funny. Sorry, my dad. These people call me say, you know, was a good project. He's a competition. We also have a landscape designer. So then I did the master plan, I went up, it's called Ludwig Bardo, a very nice person. We had a kickoff meeting, the first meeting, and then after two, three hours I said, okay, what do we do? Should we try to merge the master plans? And then the client said, can you come up for a moment out there? He said, you didn't understand, you're the architect, you do the facades, the, 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 the landscape designer does the plan. He said, sorry, because it is the other way around. The, the architect does the master plan and the, the landscape is added to flowers. In, so the, the, the must, it, it's interesting because in Holland, landscape design and urban planning are much, has a much stronger tradition. It's the architect who does the facades, you know, or the landscape who just does the flowers. So the, the plan is actually by Dr. Van. This is another project in Groningen. Um, it was just it's called Container Terminal, it's a peninsula. And then, they, it's an interesting project because um, uh, Dick Van Gamberen, he used to work, and uh, now he works back with Mecano. He did a research about high density but low rise. So the general outlook was to go on public areas to as many, um, as many cell units which would enter directly from the ground. So, you know, in Holland you have this sort of loft line. In this case, it was not possible. So, we did a plan with two 
big objects, one here and one there. In this, the center time you can only there was a sewer and that. So it's a combination of a little bit like you know, Bogdan's poem works a little bit like that. It has three big objects and then this is okay. Okay, Munich, I don't want to talk. I lost the competition in Munich. Okay. <laughs> this is my competition in Munich. And this is, I lost the competition in Vienna, which is this. Okay. This was an interesting one because it was organized partially by the architect in Central Vienna. And this issue of flexibility between the, even we are talking again to go back to, can we make buildings that come back and forth for big offices and housing? Because it's difficult today because of um, mechanical reasons of you know, ventilation. Level. But in a way, all the fabric of you know, the terrorists from the last century, Hausmannian, you know, I, I, I've seen the Mecca Napolitano came here to give lectures on Hausmann. That city survived because it could go back and forth from being a professional office to a house. Today is much more difficult. So we here we were thinking about switching back and forth from houses to <coughs> the same, is the same body, but from offices to houses. This was another loss competition in Rennes. The old went very close to be winning and then this. Many times the public areas where you a private developer was in, including an existing building. It will look the same. So this we will go quickly we sort of sometimes we will be employed in this form of models. And this had a quite nice terrorist. But always I think that we don't do particularly strange things. We always always try to this sort of idea where you touch the ground, you relate it. This is not a typological issue more related to the design. So when the building touches the ground, always tries to do some kind of gesture with the public space. This is a strange case in Russia. The plan was done by Tovat. Johannes Tovat is the, in, uh, the one the, who continued the study of um, the rough kind. And actually, this was exactly the case, as I said. He won the competition. The plan was very Dutch. These people called and said, we want architects. Uh, in Russia, they have this very complex fire, you know, the, the, the fire truck has to go in. But then they said this, listen to this. He said, we're going to build four floors because of geological reason. The top floor, we don't sell because it rains in the apartments. The ground floor, we don't sell because they steal babies. They, they kidnap babies. We only sell second and third floor. Why you hear that? I said, do you care about handicap? And they said, no, we Russian killed them, so not that. Okay. No. Do you care about energy consumption? We have a lot of oil. And in Russia, the you don't I'm joking a bit, but it's true. The the, the bedrooms are like 20 square meters, which is totally out of standards, but then uh, the kitchen is the only public place. So they took a North master plan, but they wanted to close here. So this is, these are private gardens that propose to open it up. All this ground floor issue is, a, like I said, in Italy. So it's very strange how you cannot take, if you take a rabbit and you put it to Australia, it can flourish, it can die. So in this case, this issue of the privacy of the ground floor, again, Holland is another place. I'm not saying it's bad, of course, about Holland. I'm just saying that Holland transplanted to Russia is Okay, I go quicker, quicker, quicker. Okay, that's another competition. I'm very scared of Russian because you never know if you don't want to kiss you or shoot you. It's, it's in Moscow and it's a very big Here is, okay, it was a plot. The master plot was even almost given. It was just across from the Kremlin. The master plot was given. So we did this. It's very, very dense. In Russia, they almost have no terraces. They don't, they don't care about living outside. So, very, very deep. And this is, and they like very classical architecture. 
Now they just called me yesterday, another Russian in a Katerinian group, and I said, KCFB suggested your name uh, as a neoclassical architect. And yesterday they sent me an example of the architecture neoclassical style. I said, listen, I'm happy they gave me my name, but I don't do neoclassical style or with bodies. I mean, that's going to be clear. I do modernist buildings which have a sort of flavor, but not neoclassical. What do you mean with neoclassical? Listen, I do want you because they we told you to neoclassical style. Okay? Okay, last two projects. I agree. This was a very, very big Alfa Romeo factory. See this, this one. This was the cafeteria, so gigantic, you know. Then uh, it says a story of 20 years political story. And this was a plan done by Gino Valle with a commercial center. This area which actually built housing, a big park, uh, and then a square. So this was the master plan of Gino Valle in the Milano. And we did all this part. I will tell you all the whole story because it will take three years. So we managed to do with this axis was done by Gino Valle, but all this was an existing building, the one you saw, but all this was done by us, and it was very, very dense. It was social housing, so these three are free market housing, this is social housing, this is an office building with this facility. Very complex project with very complex history, a very dense model. The problem is that there was a very noisy highway, but this is also where the south came. So we had an embarrassment because this is really noisy, but south was here. So you had to let the sunshine in, but also to screen from the noise and protect it also from the view. It was not a very nice view. This is this side. I go quick. These are three slab buildings. Very deep for Italian regions. Again, you see the bathroom that has been naturally ventilated. So this is. And we try to do very plain social housing with some kind of urban uh, presence. Again, very cheaply built, but we managed to do some. And then we did this larger side. The tower. So this is the diagonal you saw before. This is just to say, this is the famous Kambuta, which is Minami's life as Miss Dagny, how they just for story. It's the cover in a book by a German lady talking about the architecture of Milano from, this is 1910. So this portal. The, the surrounding were like this. So we tried to do something which is not that different from that, I think. It's just a little bit more version of that, the axis, so that. To try to smile to the, to the city with white teeth, a giant toothbrush brushes the teeth. Okay, not just Chino, hey Chino, everything very nice, but we don't know where to hang our clothes. <laughs> Was I trying to do this? This is Santa Borgia, the oldest church. What is this? This is the house by Caccio Dominioni. He died 102 years old. The Grafton architects just asked me to do an installation about his work in the Biennale, which I did. If you go to the Biennale, then you see. And this is Caccio Dominioni when he was young, and this is me, and he wrote to my baby Chino. So maybe he went to bed with my mother, but I don't know yet, I have to do a DNA, DNA exam. <laughs> he did the house for my parents. And once I met him, and I said, listen, Caccio, I copied the, the, the crowning of your house. Yeah, yeah, Chino, it's a good. Okay. Then, Caccio Dominioni, I mean, it's, I have to make a lecture of Caccio Dominioni. He was like an old Catholic dandy. And like 
five, six years ago, for that, of course, it was already 100, maybe 98 years old, he called me up and said, you know, Zuki, you never come visit. And I said, yeah, come visit. And you say, oh, you're young architects, you know. Let me tell you, I, I follow your work, but, you know, let me tell you, you don't you do know fucking thing about plants. I'm a plantist, I'm a plant maker. I do the slam of the plants. So he took from a magazine the plan of the Tortello, he said, to Chinonzuki this, okay? And he said, let me teach you something about the plan. He took the white corrector and he made this. So this is an original sketch by Caccio Dominioni, and I didn't dare to say this is social housing and it's already built. He said, let me talk. So I got a suggestion and posted. This was a building that 
could not stand up, it was moving. So we did this, and instead, this substitute the other one, but I, we went down to keep the silhouette. So that yeah, did this is good. I, I didn't do the whole project, I uh, did only some buildings as a master. The houses. Okay. The, the canal we built. This is the back side of the building we saw. This building was built, half of this building are built on existing foundations, so even the, the, this building has the walls and also uh, like the water garage into it. So it's all it's, it's very patchwork dimension. This, all this wall it was existing, so we built on foundations. This is the garden side. This was the, the existing, if you see, you had the back of Palladio, but it was very industrial looking thing, and the chimney. So we did this building, is actually, the, the, there was a dead end, we crossed the bridge and go there it was closed. So we, do, do, we did this, so we opened up a new path, we separated the building, and the building you saw before, we cut through it. So it's like, in Venice, the urban you can, Widen up your arms and touch the walls. Is this a social housing again? We kept the chimney. This is the new panorama. This is the existing buildings and this is the existing school. And that's the cut. So that's the building you saw before, and you cut through and go to the square. And actually, there's only three kind of windows. These are the bedrooms, these are the living rooms, and these are the, the kitchen and bathrooms. The, the nine holes are for, you know, we have gas, so it's a legal thing. So it's a very simple thing. The closest things we could do to, uh, for, for building regulation, we cannot do that, of course. How to do a house in Venice? You take a, a, a butcher block, of paper, you put on the record player that this way of this and everybody died. You think of your first log and you cry a bit, and then you you draw the, the, the windows where the tree drops. And that's it, it's very easy. In a way, it's the closest things. You know, this is a building on, on front of the Judeca. So it's a, like almost a graphic picturesque transposition of the drama. Architecture, and then this is interesting because we did this building with that cost, and then when I turned 50, I got this as a present. This is I put from internet. Do you speak? Do you speak architecture in Italy? Yes, I do. And this is a painting. This is the Alice to the house. This is a card done by some Spanish architects at the Mexican Park. And this just to say that the building has two lives: the real life, and this building has a second life for some reason. It got into this mind of people. And just to say that, looking back on what I said, this is a, 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 a lot better than what I meant by far. And in a way here it says, the functionalist is very specific, but then the rationalist all, all, also embeds um, a reserve of function. In a way, I, I think I am functionalist, but also rationalist, in a sense that this idea of the But then, what Adolf Bailey said very interesting is that the rationalist puts an emphasis on form. Form is born with the establishment of human relationships. The lonely man has related with his nature is no form of problem. Form is the condition we want better better together. He sees forms as a social contract, one can say, communication. This is an interesting issue. We need forms. So our generation has been brought up with typology, typology, typology. But then I discovered Meshesmith, he's you know, 
and thus is helpful from the 1700s would do in physiognomics. You know, the building has parts, you can they have nose and the eyes, but they also make expressions. So can you make faces with buildings? The do buildings have faces and what kind of faces do they do? And this to say we love the city. We take the plane, we go to the city. The city is not just a function of matter. It's also a place, a very romantic one, and we love it. And we, you know, we, we, the weekends we take it in general. I went to Iran, I was in a, and I took a lecture, and then I showed uh, to the lady who was helping me, and I showed this picture and said, can you take away this one, please? Because for us it's not very, we can't, in, 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 a, in a man cannot. So I took away a sensor, this image, very romantic as in Iran. I went to do this lecture in Iran. Not exactly this one, but we this slide. So we still dialogue, and it's interesting, it's any of customs. So the city is the backdrop of our ways of living. And we hope it's a lot better. And I think that's the reason. I thank you for your patience. I'm saying that 
uh, uh, Catholics accept hypocrisy as a social duty. If you would say, you know, you have this film, American films, where you have to, uh, what you think, you say loud, and everything happens. So, hypocrisy, you, you need a certain degree of hypocrisy to stay society. If it's true, hypocrisy is Martin Lutero made it. I had questions, you know, like this, you know, in the cell of the emergencies. I'm joking, but I'm saying that this problem of four has something to make. So, there's a Calvinist, in a good way, I'm not saying it's a bad way, attitude in functionalism. Functionalism is Calvinist. It's, and one who said very, very intelligent things about the better is Joseph Frank. Joseph Frank was a Jewish, he was a very intelligent person. He wrote uh, Architectures as Symbol, I think it's 27, very interesting book. And then when the Nazi came, he had to go to Sweden, and still in Sweden they use his, his uh, paper, it was an Austrian. And he says the, the tubular frame uh, a gem is not is a better sham, it's not a, you know, a, I, I have lawyer Cheska chairs. I have it in my house. Three times I broke my nose, not, not completely broke, because the Cheska chair has round, it, it's like that, it's by volume. And I go like that, and I went down, and, and I think, because, you know, for functionally, the man behaved like that. Then there's a, there's a show by uh, Munaki. A, a functionist would never think I would sit like that. The table is to do something, they don't, in, in the functionist mind, this does not exist. Or sleeping on a couch. I had enough, another lecture, but it's too late, for the research we did in Austria about, you know, this. So I said, the man from functionist, I'm not, I'm not against functionist, I'm not interested. They're like that, hinged, okay? So you don't have this redundancy. The other thing is, if I go to class alone, and an old lady dies, and a cyberpunk is born, you will not paint his uh, window green just because you have it. I'll tell you a story. The other day I went to Frankfurt. I won a competition in... It's very difficult to stop you know, to why it's easy to try to win, but... Uh, <laughs> no, no, this is an uh, I went to Frankfurt because Marco Hotels, big company, who has won the Grand Frankfurt, uh, we won a competition in Nice, in France, and in one of the buildings they did the Moxie, which is the young line of... Okay, so we went to Frankfurt to see the Moxie hotels, we started, and we were talking about where to put the cushion, how the kitchen, very, very detailed function, how the, the hotel works. Then, they have an entrance, which looked, I think, was horrible, and it was... something we can a 
a share. Uh, it's true that also function is it is uh, this algorithm we generate for. Today we can't agree anymore on what is good, and then the method becomes in a way what is good. The computer told it or you know, we, we exchange the pro if the process is good, the result must be good. We have more and more complex processes on negotiation, participation, and I'm happy to do it every day. But the question is, are we sure that the best process yields the best product? Because many times we have very mediocre products who went through all the hundred steps of the process. So if you if you type method on the internet, you get all these diagrams. Everybody has it, like the diets, you know, everybody has a diet, everybody has a method. I'm trying to go back to the idea that can we share values? I was saying before, I said, how did somebody just want to do this in Milano, in the bibliotheque? And on Facebook, I said, nice, very nice result. But then I noticed a strange thing. Until six, seven years ago, if someone would do a large, he would be killed. Killed. Now, how come the project of the last four years in the Eta, the cheaper field, they all come up right? It, should we say arch is a fashion? Arch was condemned by the modernistic movement because arch is a constructive figure which has to do with gravity. So if you think of an arch, is that if you read an arch, as a function, you can only do with bricks like that. There's a, I don't know, you know who Paul Schmidt-Lenner is? Talk about it. was a little Nazi, but very interesting. He tried to express um, architecture form, uh, let's say, in terms of the body the form. You know, something which had to do with construction. So to say, if I analyze an art as that, you cannot do an arch as a four, you only have to, have to put the bricks like that. So if you don't work in compression, why all the projects today have arches? They represent arches, but they're not built as load bearing arches. <coughs> because an arch is also a figure, Elizabeth Arden has the red one. Can we admit that an arch is born as tectonics, but then it's also a figure? That's why I was saying that. You know, so I said that these things are somehow belonging to the conventional side. When I say conventional, I say tradition. It's the dialogue way. So, I always wonder in my projects, when is the limit of formalism? Uh, do I go overboard? The last projects are very decorative. I mean, if you keep a touch, you know, let's say I made that. that last joke, okay? <laughs> I have, uh, my daughter, some three months ago, I said, Anna, are you sick? You know, you don't look well. You say, Papa, I just did not put my eyeliner on. I said, sorry, because I'm so used to see you with my liner that you look pale. And this is interesting, because when you're a 13 years old girl, you, you put all these blue things up. You know? So, between making a mask and just putting some eyeliner, the Calvinist ideas here, if you like me, you like me the way I am. Why should I wear your eyeliner? You know, you know what is this thing? That the red you know. Then the Catholic girls, they all go with high heels all over the place, the Pentecostalian girls. So can we have some soft eroticism between the nun, you know, the volunteer artists and, and then the Pentecostalian girls? When will you face Shinozuki? I hope I'm a little bit far from the story. No, I mean I'm a little bit. But of course, uh, isn't Calvinism also some kind of formalism? Because uh, the accused of Joseph Franklin, but the Bach house, is that they go to tell her style, but it's still style. When you went to Tel Aviv, all Tel Aviv is built in Bach house style. You will never, somebody from the Bach house would never, like for style, say it's better. It's a way of doing something. So Hannes Meyer, you know, to be the hero of that. But even the Bach house became a style. And the accuse of Joseph Frank is you are a style when you grow up the one to be. So when I go to the theater, joking, I see the theater style as, as any other one. The problem is, I'm sorry, 
in the end, I would say, the picturesqueness of Chimazuki, which you see here, and you want to picturesqueness, I would dare to call it, this color of it is it. Is it acceptable or unacceptable? And I would say the judgment is yours. It's also a cultural thing. You know, it's the Sahli. You, know, you have the word Sahli. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot translate Sahli in Italian. It's a German, it's a German word. And, and maybe, or it's an exotic. The Dutch people, I said, why did you call me? Because we were a little bit exotic. <laughs> no, no, we saw the, 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 the Venice house like this. So maybe, okay, okay, we shut them up. <laughs> it, it's so the cultural thing you tell what is the level of acceptability, what's the level of pleasure Okay, I will let the students do one question. Opportunity. Ask a question. Back to 